I know that um, only a few of you were able to join today, but I did, like I said, have about 10 people register and the people who registered were across the board. We had about an even split of lower, middle and upper school. So I am really going to do a full overview of the school today. Sometimes I'll kind of specialize depending on who the audience is, but today is going to be that general overview. So as I mentioned, we'll do an overview. I will give some more specific information on lower school, on middle school, on upper school, and then specifically what our admissions criteria is. And then at the end, like I said, we'll talk about next steps. So my name is Carrie Cawthon. I'm the Director of Enrollment Management and Digital Media here. I taught five years in upper school, upper school English, prior to starting at JCS. This is my third year here. Um, I've been in enrollment management my entire time here. And I just really am passionate about helping families, helping students find their path to the place where they belong. If you've had a conversation with me on the phone, you'll often hear me say, you know, even if we are not the right fit, I feel like it's my job to be a resource to families in the community. It is so challenging to even know what resources are out there and available and what specialized schools are around the area. So I'm always happy to not only talk about who the John Croson School is, and that's of course the school that I know the most about, but also try to help you navigate the path of just learning what's available. Hallie Rojeski is our head of school. Um, so she sometimes pops into these overviews. She was unavailable today, but she has a long history in being an educator and a leader for students with learning differences. Um, and she leads and navigates our school beautifully. Um, if you do a one-on-one -on -one tour here, I typically drop in her office so that you can meet her as well. So just a general overview of the state of our school, um, really focused on the individual student achievement. And I'll talk more about what this looks like in each division when we progress to the next slides. Um, we do use research-based programs, and this year specifically, as an entire staff, we are taking on restorative practices as our next step. Um, so if you are familiar with that at all, it's really about not just punishing and consequences to behaviors or harm that's done, um, but really building that connection and making sure we are 80% of the time focused on connecting and relationships so that if harm is done throughout the time, there can be that restorative end to it rather than just a consequence and moving on, which creates that supportive, safe environment, high quality faculty and staff. We do have a strategic vision that we are constantly going back to, analyzing, creating new goals. And again, that strong network of professional and community supporters. Like I mentioned before, I'm constantly reaching out to different doctors, psychologists, therapists in the area, other schools. In fact, I was just at Fletcher on Friday where it was an entire group of us talking and connecting. Um, there is a place for everybody. Um, we just tried to work together as a community to help people navigate to where, where their child will flourish. So an overview of the school, and I apologize, it seems like um, at least on my end, the formatting may have gotten a little wonky when I exported out of Canva and into PowerPoint for this. So I apologize if some of it is a little bit challenging to read. Um, but we were previously Door Academy. So if you have heard of Door before, um, that is us. We were established in 1978. In 2012, we were able to transition to the current location that we are in, and that is when we moved to the John Crosland School. As Door Academy, we were the first school in North Carolina dedicated to students with learning differences. Um, we are fully accredited. Actually, our accreditation process that happens every year, you go through reaccreditation or every couple of years, excuse me. Um, that is starting next year. So we'll be going through that reaccreditation process. Um, our one of the key things that we believe in and that we really try to protect even as we grow is our small class size. Um, I'll talk about specifics per division again, but on average, we're about six to nine students per teacher for the core classes like math, writing, reading. We do have specials or extracurriculars and that those can get up to about 13 or 14 students per teacher. So really trying to find that balance between small group so that academically those skills and that focus can happen, but also that balance where they're getting that social exposure and interaction and coaching as well. 
We have a variety of specialized programs. We do have an extended day program. So that's kind of that after school care um, for us. And you'll see a uh, uh, schedule on the next slide, I believe. But um, our day ends for lower school at 240, middle school 250, upper school three o'clock. So we do have that after school program that runs until 530 every day. We do dismiss one hour early on Wednesdays for teacher professional development. So that would be 140, 150, and two o'clock, but that after school program still runs until 530. We have enrichment sessions and clubs, middle school and upper school. These are student created clubs. So if they are something that they're interested in, like Dungeons and Dragons or chess club or fishing club, they write a proposal and it becomes a club and they meet once a week during lunch. We had a high demand from parents for lower school clubs. And so we have implemented that this year as a trial run. And so that is happening on Friday afternoons where lower school is also getting that chunk of time. That's just that high interest. They'll rotate throughout the year. Um, I think they've got like a karaoke club, which is of course a, a favorite right now. I just got a video this morning of some of the girls singing Taylor Swift. So that's been a lot of fun to see. Um, but Lego club, just that high interest. We do have tutoring, athletics, and OT speech, social skills coaching on campus. Now with this um, OT speech and social skills, I do wanna clarify. So we don't currently employ any of these therapists. Um, so it is not included in our tuition, but we have an open door policy. So if you currently work with a speech therapist or an occupational therapist, and that relationship is strong, we will allow them on campus, give them space on campus, and help incorporate it into the student's schedule where they're being pulled at an ideal time for them and then able to go back to class. So it's not another thing that you're trying to cram into that evening that's already, I know with my own kids, a very hectic time. Um, okay, so let's move on. Because this is virtual and you're not here on campus, I did just want to give you a glimpse of some of our, our favorite spots on campus for our students. Um, we, of course, have our outdoor area. So for those of you who have not yet visited the school, when you pull up, you're probably like, whoa, this is a business park. Like, what am I doing? This, there's no way there's a school back here. But the beautiful part of that is it gives us our land in the back that's fully fenced in. There is tons of space, playground equipment, basketball courts. Um, a garden. We do have a horticulture elective this year where they're bringing our garden back to life. Um, so that that's definitely a favorite spot. We have our sensory space lab, which is on our lower school hallway. A lot of our lower school students and middle school students do take advantage of this as a place where we're really working to desensitize or destigmatize the idea that a break is a bad thing. So if they are in class and their body just needs to move, the teacher might say, hey, I notice you've got a lot of wiggles going on right now. Why don't you take five minutes in the sensory space lab and then come back? And so they can pop over. It's right there close to their classroom. Pop over, bounce, jump, climb, maybe sit quietly if that's what they need, and then go back to class and continue on. We have our STEAM lab, which is where a lot of that hands-on learning takes place. We brought Lego Robotics to campus this year for our lower middle school students, so they're able to do some problem solving and creation in this room there. It has 3D printers, we have a green screen, our computers, so all kinds of things. I mean, they're doing things in here that I couldn't even fathom. Um, and then, of course, over here is the screen screen, as I mentioned. We are also bringing eSports to campus this year. That's going to be included in our athletics. So for our athletics, those typically start in fifth grade and go up to 12th grade. Um, we have cross country. That's in action right now. We have basketball and co-ed flag football. And like I said, this year we're adding esports to that. At least I know for our middle school and most likely upper school group, um, kind of easing our way into it. And then we will see how it grows from there. And then we do have a senior lounge. So our 12th graders, of course, even with a small school, they have to have some special privileges. So all of our students after lunch are required to go outside and have some of that movement time for recess. The only group that is allowed to avoid that if they want to is our senior group and they've got their senior lounge here that they can stay in. Okay, so this is what I was talking about before, but it'll give you a little bit of a breakdown. So as I said, we are a K through 12 school. We have all three divisions, lower, middle, and upper. 
Um, for lower school, that's grades K through five. Their typical school day is eight to 240, except for Wednesdays when we do dismiss that hour early. Um, we start and end the day in this advisory or homeroom period. So that is where students are doing that relationship building. I mentioned that with restorative practices, we're really making sure that we are focused on building that relationship first. And so they are starting off their day with that teacher that is there strictly to build that relationship with them in a positive way. This is where they're also getting some executive functioning support. Um, that can be organizing their binder, cleaning out their locker, just doing some of those things that we know our students need, just those gentle reminders and some explicit coaching. Um, so again, that's happening for lower, middle, and upper. I know I was going over lower, but just to be clear, that advisory or homeroom start and end of the day is all three divisions. We, this year, are just over 100 students total. So again, K through 12, just over 100 students. So that is still allowing us to stay in that six to nine student per teacher ratio across the board, K through 12. Um, and that's something that, as I mentioned, we really try to protect this year in an effort to make sure that we are staying true to that. We actually have a weight pool right now for K-1 and a weight pool for six and seven. So what this is just allowing us to do is to continue to move students through the admissions process in those grades. Um, but we recognize that right now we're at capacity. If we were to take in another K student or first grade student or seventh grade student, those classes would no longer be that six to nine ratio. Um, we wouldn't be protecting our mission and who we are. So we would be putting them into the weight pool. And from there, if a student leaves for unforeseen circumstances and a seat opens, or if we have enough students join the weight pool and it makes sense to have an additional hire um, come January when it makes sense, we would do that and form a whole new class, but always making sure we're protecting that mission and that small class size. So again, lower, middle, and upper. This looks a little bit different in terms of how it's organized. So I am going to continue on into some of the more focused slides. Um, just some overview highlights. We really focus on the student support specialists and counselors in our school. We right now have a K through seven counselor. We have an eight through 12 counselor. And then we have an additional student support specialist who can float between any of the grades. So just making sure that all of our students have that additional person that can offer support, can offer um, just that kind of touch base point if a student needs that throughout the day. In addition to being support, our upper school counselor is doing college and career counseling for students. Six through eight students are getting a weekly social emotional class. So we know middle school in particular is a beast of its own. Um, and so we want to make sure that students are getting that explicit focus on things like um, conflict resolution, problem solving, understanding different perspectives and things like that. So they're getting that in that weekly class. We do on-campus proctoring of the MAP test, SAT, ACT, whatever is needed there. Um, MAP test is the main standardized test that we use. Um, unlike other schools that have end of course or end of grade testing, we do not do that because we know that that is more of an assessment of did you learn, say, your third grade material. And our students aren't necessarily doing that. And so with MAP testing, we're still getting that measure of are you progressing each year? But it's more because the test if they're getting the questions right, the questions get harder. If they get them wrong, they get easier. It's more of an accurate reading of where the student is. All right, so taking a look, wow, the formatting is really wonky on this, and I apologize. Um, definitely something I will adjust before my second presentation of that this year. Um, but for our lower school, Antoine Brisbane here is our director of lower and middle school, and this year, Amber Dutcher is his assistant director of lower and middle school. So they really are just a power team um, where they are planning, taking care of the students, of the teachers. There's also Nashara Bynum. She is our lower middle school counselor, which I mentioned on the last slide. But with our lower school in particular, we are grouping students based on ability rather than on grade level. So if you were to come on a tour of the school and we stepped into one of our lower school classrooms, you wouldn't necessarily see all fourth graders in the room. There might be third, fourth, and fifth graders in the room mixed together in that reading block. And when they transition to, say, math, 
they may be with a different teacher and with a different group of students. And that's because we are really looking at what support they need, what remediation they need, or what kind of a challenge they need. We know that just because a student might need Orton-Gillingham for reading remediation doesn't necessarily mean that they need that level of support for math. So they might be in a group that's getting that OG intensive remediation for sounding out words, but then more working at a challenging level for math, and we're able to differentiate with that. So we're using that multisensory approach, specifically Orton-Gillingham for our lower school and a little bit into our sixth and seventh as well, if that is needed. Um, we have specials. They rotate through them. So that typically happens in the afternoon. We know our students tend to work better, be more focused, be more um, open to kind of being pushed and challenged a little bit in that morning window. So we keep the fun stuff in the afternoon with specials. We have art, music, PE. This year we have around the world, which has been a lot of fun, um, and horticulture. With middle school, it's still very closely aligned with the structure that we have in lower school. Um, sixth and seventh, there is some flexibility of grouping based on ability, but we are starting to make that transition in middle school to getting more used to being grouped with your grade level because our upper school is fully accredited. They are taking the credits that they need to earn their North Carolina diploma. So there is less flexibility in that schedule and that structure. Um, for example, when they get to ninth grade, they have to take the ninth grade requirement for English. They're still at that small class size. They're still getting the accommodations and support they need to succeed, but there is that class requirement. So we kind of have to bridge from tons of flexibility in lower school, not really flexibility in upper school. So middle school is that middle ground where we're starting to transition them. So it's not a total culture shock by the time they get to upper school. But still, multi-sensory approaches, they still can receive that Orton-Gillingham remediation, um, really starting to dig even deeper into that executive function support. Um, like I mentioned, their binders, are they organized, are they clean? Across the board as a school, we utilize agendas, you know, old school paper agendas where they have to write their homework down. Um, the teacher may initial beside it. So making sure that there's that level of support and accommodation. We also have something called structured study. And so this is um, Rachel Pete. She's that student support specialist that I mentioned. She is over our structured study program. This is for all three divisions. So if a student, for example, doesn't complete their homework, um, we don't want that to be a battle that you're having at home. That's something that we as a school assigned, and so we should be holding them accountable for, and that's where structured study comes into play. So Ms. Pete would pull them right at the beginning of their lunch period, um, and she would walk them through, you know, what's going on? Why didn't this get completed? Is it because you don't understand? Is it because you just didn't want to do it? And then she helps them get that done, um, send an email to the teacher and to the parent when it's done. So there's that level of accountability and just teaching the student what that looks like. And then they're able to continue on to recess. We do not take away their recess time, just to be clear. They may have a working lunch, but we do not take away recess. We know they need time to run and play. Okay, so I know I'm doing a lot of talking. I know I am uh, just kind of dumping information on you. I also know that I said I would stop recording when there were questions, but I do want to pause for just a second while I'm in the lower and middle school slide and open up the chat box or unmute if you're comfortable and just see how everyone is doing. Any general questions about anything I've said so far? I can jump in first, I guess, since nobody's nobody's um, chiming in. So, I, a, a couple of questions, and and um, you know, you can let me know if if um, if you'll answer them later or not. Um, I noticed that you use the 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 vocabulary learning differences versus learning deficits or special education. Can you talk to me a little bit about the schools? Um, structure from a general education standpoint to a special education standpoint and and is the school considered a um a specialized or special education school such as like a melmark or is this considered a general education school with just this heightened level of support and and small classroom size 
That is a great question. Um, and I am going to get into specifics about our admissions criteria at the end of this. But I just to quick answer your question, we are considered a specialized education school. All of our students that attend our school do have a formal diagnosis. And I will dig more into what that specifically looks like in just a little bit. But great question. Thank you so much. I'll let somebody else go next. I do have a couple more, but I'll, I'll okay. chime in after. <laughs> Okay, so what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to continue on to just giving that quick overview of upper school, and then we will get into some of the specifics of our admissions criteria, things like that, and I'll open the door again for questions. If it seems like everyone right now is okay with the lower middle school overview. Before I jump to upper school, I obviously need to talk about the way other end of our school. We do have a kindergarten program, so we do not have pre-K. I often have people ask about that, but we do have kindergarten. Um, our kindergarten program is really focused on the, it's called foundational kindergarten because it's focused on how, how do you even be a student? Um, you know, we're, our lower school, our kindergarten students are receiving that Orton Gillingham reading remediation. They are still getting play time, center time, things like that, but it's also a lot of how do I sit in this chair while my teacher is giving this instruction? How do I follow a schedule? How do I accept that it's 9 a.m. and I really want a hot dog, but I can't have it right now? I'm just trying to get students to understand that process of what school feels like. Really, really focused on that at the beginning of the year. And then as the year progresses, digging more into the deeper um, educational concepts. All right, so our upper school, for us, we classify 8th through 12th as upper school, even though our, it is only our 9th through 12th graders that are taking the um, courses that are required for their diploma. But as I mentioned, our students are earning their North Carolina diploma. We are considered a college prep upper school. Um, like I said, though, it's still that 6 to 9 student-teacher ratio. Um, teachers are still doing things like providing fill in the blank notes or really breaking down projects instead of just saying, hey, here's this project and it's due in two weeks. So it is still very supported, even though they are doing what they need to get that diploma and continue on to a four-year college should that be their choice. Um, the last three or four years, 100% of our graduating seniors have gone on to a two-year or four-year college. They are getting support from Miss Bailey. She's that 8th through 12th counselor that I mentioned. Um, she's doing a lot of that planning of what comes next. Um, oftentimes, that is just having conversations early and often with the students and the families. Um, we discover that, you know, students might have expectations over here. Parents have expectations over here. And over the years of high school, it's a matter of how do we get here and find a place where both are happy and the potential of success is as high as possible. Um, we do partner with CPCC where students can take some classes through them their 11th and 12th grade year if that makes sense and is something that they would be prepared to do. We also have a beta club. This year we have our buddy program. That's something that Miss Bailey has brought back to life. It was a pre-COVID initiative and then that, as we all know, kind of derailed everything and we're still trying to get everything back on track from that. Um, but we were able to kick off our buddy program for the first time actually last Friday. So our upper school students are buddying up with some of our younger students. And at least once a month, they're going to pair up and do various things together. Um, this is a really, really fun opportunity. I was able to observe one of our new 10th graders working with one of our kindergartners this last Friday. And this 10th grader normally does not say a word very, very quiet, very kind, but just not an outspoken, talkative student. Most of the time if he's in the room, you won't know he's there. And the way he just opened up and blossomed with one of our kindergartners, it was just fascinating to watch. So very excited that this program is back up and running. Um, our upper school is run by Mr. Hurd. He um, does all things academic planning, scheduling, um, all that good stuff for our upper school students. Okay, so to get into the nitty gritty of our admissions criteria. So all of our students, in order to meet our criteria, 
have to have a formal diagnosis of a specific learning disability. So that can be in reading and writing and math um, or and or ADHD. So we have some students who attend and they just have an ADHD diagnosis. We have some students who attend who have dyslexia and ADHD or dysgraphia and ADHD or maybe just dyslexia. Um, and then if you have a specific learning disability and or ADHD, you can also have a diagnosis of level one autism. Now, our kindergarten level, we're a little bit more flexible with that. We do accept students who only have an autism diagnosis at that time, but we are transparent that moving forward, they would need to obtain a learning disability and or ADHD diagnosis in combination with that. We just know that, you know, that pre-K kindergarten level, they're not always getting those additional diagnoses that early. Um, so I know this can be a little bit confusing. We do not right now accept students who only have a diagnosis of autism in grades one through 12. There has to be that learning disability and or ADHD paired with the autism diagnosis. Now, I also mentioned level one. Um, Typically, that is the level that we are accepting just because of the support that we have here. We want to make sure that we are accepting students where we are confident that we have enough support to set them up for success and the other students in the room as well. Um, but we also are aware that that level can be very fluid. So if you have a evaluation that was done two years ago and you've done a ton of work and there's been a ton of growth, but that two years ago diagnosis is level two, that doesn't mean that we are just necessarily going to turn you away. A lot of times what that will then look like is me reaching out to the evaluator or the therapist or whoever you've been working with and just confirming, yes, we do think that they're a good fit for your school, having those initial conversations. Um, so that is the diagnosis portion. We also look for average or above average IQ. So for us, this is going to be typically a full scale IQ or a general ability index. If you have no idea what that means, general ability index is typically the IQ score that removes that processing speed. So again, we know that a lot of times our students maybe just need some more time to process. And so that makes their IQ score when you're looking at that full scale IQ look lower than it actually is. So we will accept the general ability index as well. We're typically looking for about 80 or above in those scores. Again, it's not just a black and white, we see 79 and we're like, nope, you're out. It will do some digging and kind of see what's going on there as we read the evaluation, which brings us to the requirement of the evaluation. We do require a complete psychological educational evaluation that is less than three years old. If you do not have this, we will accept the IEP and the evaluation that the school completes to do the IEP. Um, sometimes it does not have all of the information we need. And so what I often tell families is just send me what you have. You know, I don't want you to go out and immediately try to start researching and paying all this money to get things if you don't know if you need it or not. So just send me everything that you have. I will take a look at it all. And then I can more specifically tell you you know, yes, we have everything we need, or we need this one little piece, and you can go about obtaining that. So typically what this looks like is a family will start here, start with this conversation where you're getting to know the school. Um, as I mentioned, if you haven't already, you can sign up for a one-on-one -on -one tour. There is a place on our website under the admissions tab called Tours and Events. And at the very top of the page, there's a button that says schedule your tour here. And it takes you to my calendar where you can just click the day and time that works best for you. And then I will be the one to show you around the school. Um, that happens during the school day. So we actually get to go into the classrooms, talk to some of the students, talk to the teachers and really get a feel for who we are as a school. You know, I could talk about it until I was blue in the face. And believe me, I actually could. Um, but it just doesn't mean the same until you actually get to see it yourself. After the tour, if, you know, I've reviewed the documentation and I'm like, yep, it appears like your child meets our criteria. You've done the tour and you're like, yes, this seems to check the boxes of what we are looking for in a school that I would get you started in the full admissions process. So this all happens online in our parent portal. You would complete the application and you would get two recommendations. We do prefer that at least one of the two recommendations be a teacher. Once we have that full packet completed, we schedule a two to three day student visit. So, you know, we go through all of that work, we're required to obtain all that paperwork, 
but the truth of the matter is we want to meet the student. We want the student to be able to attend our school, interact with them. It's not just like a shadow experience where they sit in the back of the room and don't interact. They will be in class. If the class is doing a game, they're going to play the game. If they're doing a worksheet, they're going to do the worksheet. You know, we want it to feel as confident as possible at the end of that visit because it is a two-way street that we as a school can say, yes, you know what, we feel like we've got everything we need to set this child up for success. But also you as a family can say, yeah, my kid was really happy when they got in the car after that visit. Or yeah, you know, he was talking about Johnny playing on the playground all day long and he never talks about friends at school. So we want that to be um, experienced before the admissions committee meets and decides if we can offer a contract or not. With that being said, school has obviously started. It is September 9th. Um, so we have entry points throughout the year. We used to do where students could just kind of go through the process at any point and we would let them in at any point. Um, we discovered that that was really doing a disservice to the new students and to the current students and teachers. So what we do now is entry points. So if you go through the process, you apply by September 25th and you are accepted, the student start date would be October 14th. Same with December 2nd and then January 7th, January 21st, and then February 10th. And so what this allows us to do is really have cohorts of new students. We know that there will be, say, four new students starting on October 14th. I can do an orientation with those families, really make sure they're set up. Teachers can really prep their class, can prep themselves, make sure they're all set up, and it can hopefully ensure a, a seamless process of students, new students starting. We also offer financial aid. So this can look a couple different ways. We do accept the NCSEAA scholarships, if you're familiar with those. There's the ESA Plus grant and the Opportunity Scholarship. If you are not familiar with those, I strongly suggest that you start researching. Um, that is a North Carolina scholarship that's not through us specifically. The priority window for that opens on February 1st. And what you need specifically for the ESA is an IEP, that eligibility determination document. So if you're not familiar with that, um, it's a lottery system. It's money that can be put directly towards private school education um, or other tutoring, things like that expenses. So I strongly suggest you look into that. And I'm happy to share the website for that after this if you need it. Um, but we as a school also offer our own financial aid. So on our website, there is an application. Um, that's a third party system where you complete the application. It walks you through everything you need to submit. It gives us then a recommended award based on everything you completed. So we take that and then we combine that with how many, how much financial aid funds do we have left in our bucket for this year? And the financial aid committee determines if we can offer an award. All right. I'm not used to just talking this much, you know, when I taught, it seems like it was all I did and I've kind of gotten out of that habit. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna stop this recording and I'm going to open the floor up for any questions, conversations that we can have. Um, but before I do that, I do wanna thank you so much for joining and for listening to me talk nonstop for 30 minutes about our school. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions, you can go to our website, you can schedule a tour there, or you can just get my phone number, my email address, and request more information that way as well. But I am going to stop recording and open the door for questions.